All right, all right, guys. Uh, unsolicited comments are now uh, <laughs> we're uh, we're live. Good of course, morning. of course, good that good was good morning out there. Yes, good morning. All right, Exodus Exodus three. So we're in our our series when God calls your name, and I'm about to call a few names right now. But when God calls your name, uh, so we're back at the burning bush with Moses and. Uh, this, uh, this particular segment will focus on the fatherliness of God, the fatherliness of God, and we'll relate that in just a moment because we're dealing with, uh, you know, where we left off last week on presuppositions about God, which is a fancy word for how we think, how we think about God, how God was going to change Moses' thinking uh, about himself, and so... Um, you know, you might think, how, how do I think about God? How do you think about God? How do we think about God? How do, how do people in general think about God as you have conversations with them? Uh, that is an interesting thing. A lot of times you don't really realize that until you're in the, th in the throes of some uh, difficulty. Um, your expectations of God, what you expect God to do for you, or, you know, perhaps uh, someone who doesn't know the Lord, um, someone you know, uh, struggling uh, what their expectations of God to be. Sometimes it keeps people from uh, knowing Christ, you know, just because of their expectations of God and God didn't act in a certain way, therefore. Um, so let's pick up uh, Exodus 3 and verse 1 again. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, came to Horeb, the mountain of God, which would later, by the way, uh, be called that. Of course, Moses is writing this whole account after the fact, right? And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And notice, not from the midst of the bush, <laughs> which is a lesson in and of itself, right? Any old bush will do, right, when, when God gets a hold of it. Uh, but uh, in the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, well, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, well, here I am. And then he said, that is God, do not come near, remove your sandals from your feet for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. I'm sure that was completely new to uh, Moses, uh, these kind of regulations, right? And he, he said also, well, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So um, this covenant-keeping God. And then Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, well, I've surely seen the affliction of my people that are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. And so I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Worth coming just to know how to pronounce those, right? Now, behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said, well, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring this? Now, 40 years have passed, according to 730 of Acts, right? And then you see uh, just prior to that, within the same passage as Stephen's message, as Luke records it in Acts chapter 7, that Moses supposed that the people would think he's the deliverer. So again, this is quite a reversal, right? Who am I? Yeah, who are you indeed, right? So uh, when God calls when God calls your name. And this, you know, the fatherliness of God, again, again, throwing that, throwing that in there. And uh, we'll, we'll sort of squirrel our way uh, into that. But just backing up a little bit, that uh, 730, as I mentioned, Acts chapter 7 and, and, and verse 30, when, just paraphrasing it, if I'm not directly quoting it, and when 40 years had passed, which most of the translations would say something like that, uh, to be really, really literal in translating it, maybe, uh, play role, right? When, when 40 years uh, were completed, you know, completed, uh, to give some perspective on it, the noun 
that goes along with that play role, play Roma. This would be Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of, of the time had come, God sent forth this, I remember that passage, uh, the fullness. So just at that right time, that right specific time, not, not a day before, a day after, a week before, a week after, a month before, a year, so on and so forth. Just right then, right then, that's, that's when he was supposed to come, right, right then. Uh, and, and the same idea uh, here, when that 40 years had expired, that'd be fair, you could say something, but completed, you know, there, there it was. So there's, this was a specific time. So uh, Moses was on, as we've suggested, is on this collision course with God. You know, he has an appointment with God. This burning bush was on God's calendar, you know, Moses. And just like, I mean, God has, I, I believe, these, these with us as well. It may not be a burning bush, but the impact of it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be that. And it, this is what we could say is a, the, the, the Pentecost of the church. This can be, certainly, we can have a, a similar type. I'm not saying individual Pentecost experience. I'm not saying that per se. But what I'm saying is that we can have these types of moments where God, you know, has to, to sort of break through to us in such a way uh, to get through past our own presuppositions of him, or at least this is part of, we've suggested a little bit of a stair-step approach here with, with Moses. You know, first you've got to kind of get your attention to get you to the point where now, uh, in order to get there, wherever there is, which we're suggesting is this incarnational life, but with Moses is a place of ultimate usefulness, right? In order to get, how are we going to get you to the point of use? We can't get you there if you still haven't figured out who God is. And we don't mean that in the sense of, well, I've got my theology, right? Because that, you know, we can do that. We can actually construct a theology and still not be of a whole lot of use if, if you know, our, our whole suppositions and presuppositions of, are, of God are, are, are skewed somewhat. And they can be somewhat culturally conditioned. They can be conditioned by our own um, experiences of God or what we presume to be experiences of God, our own just life experiences per se. And then, you know, we sort of read those into the text as we interpret the text and a whole bunch of things, right? Um, so the first thing we'd say, there's an appointed time here for Moses and <clears throat> Moses is right on schedule. Why? Because Moses figured it out. Uh, Moses got a peek at God's calendar. No, because, you know, hmm, God ordained all this. So God, God worked it out and uh, did it uh, even, even in a very natural way. Then the second thing, uh, he did this for a purpose, and we see this in, in Exodus 3, 12. Uh, certainly, I will, well, in, in Exodus, uh, yeah, eventually, but Exodus 3, 10, come now, I'll send you, I'll send you uh, to Pharaoh, right? And then a third thing, um, he did this uh, by intersecting with his normal life uh, and by gaining his attention. We see this in the opening verses there, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So, with every expectation, uh, we could expect God to do similarly in our life. If we take just a general, what we might call general kind of theological principle here, God works in our normal day-to-day. -day. God intervenes in our world, and he does this. God isn't some transcendent being that just is, is way off in the out there in the abstract. But God, just he didn't just in some deistic way create things and then wind it up and off he went. You know, that he's, that he's here, he's, he's involved with us in a very in, intensive and, and deeply personal way, and not just in the general, you know, I'm involved with humankind way, <laughs> you know, by, oh, I don't know, I make it rain, I, I grow crops, you know, but he, he actually, you know, he's right there with us, uh, which is, you know, kind of hard to grasp sometimes, but he does, he does care, as we'll see uh, later on, care. It's a big word in this fatherliness thing. He does care. He really does care in a very active sense. And he never stops caring. That caring is always engaged. This is mind-boggling, but true. And then a fourth thing here today, uh, to correct this faulty thinking about God. And I would guarantee, uh, just to say it flat out, nobody has a correct theology. Nobody, nobody's theology is perfect. Nobody, nobody can claim that, right? So we're all like, hmm, you know, we all do the best we can to try to line everything up. And, and the biggest challenge is to, to have one that aligns with how we behave, one that aligns with how, you know, that's actionable, that, that really engages at the level of doing, that we're doing theology, that we're living it, that we're living it out, and that we're experiencing 
God through living out his truth, you know, because that's what we want. I mean, we, we don't want a cerebral life. We don't want just a reasoned life, but we want a life that um, impacts us in terms of our experience as far as our enjoyment of God, right? We want to enjoy God. What would, what would be the sense of knowing someone, but you never um, in, enjoy them, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the end out. So do we have faulty presuppositions about God? So we see this in terms of, of Moses. We see this in, in his, you know, trekking along and coming to this burning bush. And then um, this is where we, we kind of want to, you know, pick it up with him. And we started in a, just a, a little bit this with, with him last, last week. And just, just <clears throat> to see that Moses is going to uh, come to terms with a God that is categorically um, separate from uh, matter, separate from things, um, and, and so on, you know, and, and you see this just a bit with, you know, take the, the sandals off your feet and, and that type of, of language, you know, um, and, and so on. The idea of just holiness itself, and we're not really getting into all that at this point, but, but a God that is not stuff, a God that is not something, and he's going to know this somewhat just by the nature of I'm sure the idea of, of creation and uh, 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 Moses is going to be well acquainted with uh, uh, the creation accounts and, and, and all of these things. For, he, he's going to write them, right? He's, he's going to be well acquainted with all these things that have been passed down and, and so on. Uh, but what preconceptions could, could Moses possibly have had uh, of this creator and, uh, and perhaps even knowing of the God of this God being a covenant keeping God, knowing of of um, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and these accounts, and, and so on and so forth, being passed down as well, um, and, and so uh, all all of these things that um, you know, or or perhaps we could we could uh, take a shot at uh, surmising, and and don't want to put too much into into Moses's mind, but. Uh, there's a lot of these things that uh, perhaps could could fill the uh, the the mind of uh, Moses at at this particular time. What we do know is that God did reveal Himself uh, through a name in Exodus chapter three and verse fourteen. He says, "Well, well, I am who I am," and um, the the Hebrew there is just the infinitive. It's just a simple infinitive. And if you were to just look it up in Hebrew, that's all you'd see is if, if you looked it up in English and saw the to be verb, you know, and, and so variously translated I am or, or I will be, it really doesn't matter, but it's the idea that, you know, I'm, <clears throat> God is, is who he is or will be who he will be. So it's a testament to, to Moses that he's unlike the, the changing nature of all created things. See, if God was just, <clears throat> you know, in, uh, um, in, in, in semantics, you, 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 you call it referential language, whoopee, right? But it just means that you, you, you want to point to something as though um, you want to name it. And whatever you name it, that means it refers to that demonstrably. You know, it refers to that thing or that person. You know, so God is like, yeah, you, mm, no, you can't. You, can't do that with me. You just can't slap a name on me as though that's, you know, going to be the substance of the totality of, of what I am because I'll, I'll be what I'll be. I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm changeless. I'm not, I don't have the nature of, of created things. I'm the abiding constant. I'm, I'm unchanging. I'm the, I'm the changeless one. I'm the eternal present. I'm always, and, um, and of course, that's going to be relative to, to observers as we talked about last week, but who is God? And so um, that's an interesting, an interesting thing to, to think about maybe, but Moses, Moses is, is not going to have a lot of time to just speculate on the metaphysics of the being of God, you know. He's going to have to come to terms with that in his, in his real life, you know. Now, just park that for a second, like we did a little bit last week, but think a little bit more deeply on this. Think of someone else in the New Testament, say, the, say Saul of Tarsus, who had a similar, you know, cartwheel in terms of his understanding of God. And you say, well, how so? I mean, 
Uh, Saul was a monotheist. He believed in, in God. What difference does it make? He was a Jew. He believed in God. Um, and so Jesus appears to him on the Damascus Road and says, so I'm, I'm Jesus and, and all, all this stuff. So what's, what's the big leap? What's the big leap? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 5, I'm, I'm Jesus, you know, and, uh, and you know, you're, you're persecuting me and you're the, I'm the one you're persecuting. And, and so here's this, you know, he's hearing this, this voice. And, and so the idea here, though, is, is a little interesting, especially when you, when you come to a passage like Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15. And I don't know that you really, you really sort of have to sit on Galatians 1, uh, 15 for a second and let your eyes, uh, uh, especially on verse verses 13, 14, and 15, and let your eyes pick up on, on a couple of words there. But here, uh, here's Saul of Tarsus. He's no longer going to conceive of Jesus of Nazareth to be this kind of fallen leader of this you know, sectarian group of separatist Jews. And yet he says, well, okay, so talking about what happened on the Damascus Road, he says, well, it pleased God to reveal his son in me. And you might simply look at that and say, Oh, yeah, I got it. Okay, got it. So he's just describing his conversion right there. And yeah, of course he is, because before that, he was just a, you know, a, 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 a practitioner of Judaism, studied at the feet of, of Gamaliel. We get that. He was a rabbi and all these type of things. But yet, Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 is going to tell us that to, to switch from that to being a bond slave, you know, because he self-identifies now as being a, a bond slave because Paulus apostolos doulos, you know, so just, just to play with me with the Greek for a minute, right? So these are all, um, uh, if you, you listen to the ending, Apollos, Apollos, uh, doulos, right? And so he, Paul is basically saying, I will, I, will, I will answer to any one of those as my proper noun, as my, as my name, all in the nominative case. You know, you can call me Paul, you can call me apostle, or you can call me bond slave. All of those. When he says uh, a, a bond slave of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, it means all of those, you know, are going to uh, identify with Christ all of those being possessed by, you know, possessed by, by him, right? So this is really, really powerful stuff. And then he goes on to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ's power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. Therein is the gospel. If, if, if you, there is the righteousness of God I'll reveal from faith, just as written the faith, that the just shall live by faith. If you add verse 17 into that. Now, you say, okay, fair enough. But how does a guy go from? And you say, all right, all right, wait a minute. Okay, he's a Jew, he's a rabbi, whatever. How does he go from that to, you know, following the Messiah, Damascus? Well, because of the Damascus Road. You know, because of the Damascus Road and, and because now Jesus is alive. And he's, maybe he saw him. You know, maybe he was there in Jerusalem, maybe all that. But, but even if he didn't, now... Jesus is alive, and that's what convicted and everything else. Um, okay, but I got one better for you. So if you look, at, if you can Galatians chapter, chapter one, and just humor me for a moment, I just want you to put you know a word together in the uh, antecedent a little bit, or in the context, Judaism. Just grab Judaism with his son, and say, how do you get those two words together? How do you get those, reconcile those two things? Judaism, studying at the feet of Gamaliel, according to Acts 22, 3, with his son. And we all know the Jews are looking for a Messiah, but then the son of God, the son of God, how does a Jew, how does a practicing Jew who's a radical monotheist, think of a Muslim today, what difficulty would a Muslim today, a radical monotheist, a strict radical monotheist, um, how do you get, how do you get to uh, a Trinitarian? How do you get to son from that? How do you extrapolate son from that? You don't, you don't reason your way to that. You just don't. Um, now, uh, here's a fellow, you know, here, yeah. So what, 
what I what I'm saying is, uh, oh, oh, I, I'm going to show you something else. Pardon me, pardon me, just rattling on here. Um, six, uh, sixteen and seventeen, same Gal Galatians, right? He says to reveal a son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Oh, and by the way, because you could easily say, well, you know what? So he was converted and then he ran off and got catechized by who? Yeah, you're shaking your head, right? Because you know, right? So he didn't. He didn't at all. He didn't consult with it. That's what makes this so real, right? Because <laughs> he didn't. He said, I didn't talk to anybody. That's what makes it so genuine. You know, he didn't go to James. He didn't go any, to any of the Jerusalem elite. This is just God. That's, that's how we know. Revealed his son in me. So this is just incredible. And all I'm saying is, when we look at Moses and we look at everything God is going to do in him, it isn't like it all happened at the burning bush. It's like, there you go, done deal, boom. Burning bush, now Moses suddenly knows everything about me. Now Moses is good to go. Because we know that's not the case, you know? He's going to grab that staff in his hand, and, uh, you know, what's that in your hand? Oh, I guess it's uh, one of these, right? And then he's going to say, throw it down, and then, we get, and then you know, pick it up, and then your hand, and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, and so we, we know what happens, right? So, so anyway, just not to get ahead of ourselves, but what's going to happen is over time, over time, Moses is going to have to learn uh, through clear and visible, demonstrable acts of God, that this God that you can't see with your eyes. I mean, it's one thing for the disciples that are the guys right here. You know, the guys here, I can see what he's doing, you know. I can listen to his, his teachings. I can just sit with him. I can talk to him. Um, I, can, I can observe his, his miracles firsthand, all these things. But now, you know, you've got... You've got Moses, you know, um, here at a burning bush and hearing a voice, I'm sure. But, but now, I mean, he, it's just going to be him. It's just going to be him um, out there with Pharaoh. And sure, this God says, I'll be with you. But he's the tip of the spear. And God's throwing the spear. And he just has to believe that God's going to back him. So he has to believe in the fullness of God's presence, power, that, that God's presence and power are sufficient backing to support his promises, right? So here, here it is. Here are my promises, and my presence and power will be sufficient in that time uh, when you need to call upon my presence and power to... hmm. Uh, bankroll my promises. Does that sound like how like faith works and, and how we we live, right? So we have all these promises, and then sort of does faith write the check or does faith cash cash the check or write the check? How does that work? So we we have these promises, and then here the the spirit of God, here's the power of God, here's something that is with us. You know, and then we have to act. We have to act in faith based on the promises of God, knowing that, that his presence and power are there. Um, so um, here, Moses, by means of these multiple interventions, God would call upon the witness of, of his historical record. I mean, then going forward, God's going to establish a precedent, begin to establish a precedent. And so faith isn't, isn't always that, that, that way that we're just stepping into the dark all the time. Um, nor are we to always say that, well, because God has always acted that way, he'll always act this, you know, of course, God's nature is unchanging, but God isn't bound to always act the same way with the same people all the time, you know, all, always, right? But here, here's this historical record um, to validate the certainty of, of future performance. That is to say, um, as I have been with Moses, so I'll be with you, you know, he says to um, Joshua, right? But uh, just give you 
just give you an example that I think is just interesting, right in the text, just internal evidence here. If you check out um, Exodus chapter 14, if you want a kind of a cryptic little uh, passage here, by cryptic I mean you'd be high pressed to understand what's going on here. Exodus 14, 15, and 16. Now we fast forward ahead to the Red Sea, and they are, you know, uh, 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 standing, you know, point blank in front of it in despair, uh, walled in. Exodus 14, 15, and 16. Um, if, we, if we back up to verse 13, just before the Red Sea is divided, and how all that comes about. Uh, they're, they're walled in. Uh, on either side, Pharaoh is, is coming down on them. They can see the plumes of dust rising. Uh, and then you've got among the people, right, saying, um, uh, what, what you brought us out here to die in the wilderness, and, and it couldn't be any worse. I mean, how, how much worse could it be uh, physically, uh, the terrain, everything's against you, in front of you, to either side of you, and in back of you. You're uh, the people that were once with you, the people that were like, you know, yeah, we're, we're, we're out of Egypt. This is great. Now we've got all this money. We spoiled the Egyptians. Look at us go and everything else. Now they're like, what, what, what a fool you are, Moses. Why did you bring us out here to die? You know, every, it couldn't be any worse. How much worse could it possibly be? And But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Um, sounds great so far. Sounds like, wow, what a man of faith. What a courageous man of faith. He's for the Egyptians whom you see today. You'll never see them again forever. And the Lord will fight for you uh, while you keep silent. But there's something missing here. Because he says in verse 15, Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? There's something missing there. It's as though Moses begins to say, like, um, all right, Lord, I did my part. Now I'm not seeing anything move here. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine, you know, making that public scene? And it's like, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. Just watch. God's going to do it. Anytime, Lord. Uh, yep. Anytime you want to just, just make a way here. And nothing happens. And nothing happens. So we're not really sure what's going on here at all. It's like there's a whole block of stuff missing. It's like, what, what's going on? But it says, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Because there's nothing in the context directly that even shows that he's crying out to God. There's something going on internally there with Moses. Tell the sons of Israel to go forward but lift up your staff and stretch out your hand. It's the same language when you go back to chapter four and verse one. What's that in your hand? And it's as though a recollection back, this will be a sign to you about his presence and power. And there's something about this, not that there's some magic in this staff but there was something there about relying on the presence and, and power of God that there perhaps was some disparity between the words of Moses and what he actually believed concerning God's direct intervention. Because this would be the time to actually see God now directly intervene. Now. And so... God is about to demonstrate for Moses, and this is going to begin some pattern going forward. So we see the Bible is a living testament to the, to the living and changeless I am, whose operations in the world do not cease, uh, who in fact resides in the life of the believer, from whom may be drawn in endless quantity all that is needed to equip for service, to sustain for life, and to withstand the enemy. If you, if you consider, without taking a lot of time 
time here to do this, but you can trail this just through the book of Ephesians alone. Um, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, for example, in him you also, after listening to the message of the gospel, you were, you were sealed. This is passive then. So you were sealed, verses 19 and 20, um, where uh, he says, um, and what is the surpassing greatness of, so he's talking about you were sealed with the, with the Holy Spirit, so you're marked out for him. And then he says, well, what is this power, power that he's gonna talk about later in the book? This is the power that, that raised Jesus from the dead. In chapter three and verse 16, Paul prays that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit. Then verse 20, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly according to the power that is at work in you. And then chapter 5 and verse 18, again, that's our word, our verb, pleroo, to be filled with the spirit. And then chapter 6 and verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his, of his might. So the idea of strengthen yourself by drawing on his endless supply of his, his endless supply of power to do. That's the idea of his might and you're drawing from it to, to do. So why does Jesus then self-identify in this way as this I am, right? So because you, you see God disclosing himself to Moses in this way. And then Jesus turns around and identifies this way as well, as this I am, this eternal constant, the one who is always at the ready. And this is not just so that we can say, well, um, see, there he's divine, he's the son of God. But no, he's saying, um, okay, I am the eternal, cons I'm, I'm at the ready now today and whose presence, power, and promises are delivering his will according to his word in his way and in his time. This means that we are to be seeking after, looking for with expectation, um, the interventions of Jesus through the agency of his spirit to work out the will of the Father in in our time, and I don't mean our timing, but in, in our day, in our lives, and through, through our lives. So where is this happening in my life? I say, where is this happening? How is this happening? Is this happening? And God's disclosures to Moses are personal, relational, intimate, are intended to be apprehended um, at the deepest point of his conscious awareness. Again, to fast forward to the believer's new covenant ex uh, spiritual experience, we have the abiding and intuitive witness of the Holy Spirit, and this is Romans 8, 14 through 16. As many as are led by the Spirit, um, they are the, the sons of God, uh, and so on. You can read that, that whole passage uh, underscores this. So here, the central and incontrovertible truth that is the greatest comfort for us all and the greatest support to our feeble steps of faith is this, and this is Exodus three twelve. God says to Moses, but... I will be with you. And we read the same of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 13 uh, and verse 12, where uh, the passage is, therefore Jesus also that he might, uh, or 13 and 5, make sure that you're, um, Character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. But other other uh, places, Matthew, he says, I will be with you always, even to the end of, of the age. Um, and so uh, Joshua chapter one, verse five, as I've been with Mo Moses, so I will, I will be with you. Isaiah 41, 10, you can read the same thing, and as I mentioned, Matthew 28, 20. Um, but how do people conceive uh, of God? And uh, recent, recent polling, uh, for example, just in the American public, uh, since 1985, the number of those who claim certainty of belief in God has slipped from 60% to 50% of the U.S. population, if you can imagine. We're talking about certainty of belief in God. And the poll addresses the issue 
of the precipitous decline of church attendance in the U.S., but observes that this is not a measure of spirituality, so you don't want to connect the two, but those outside the church may be spiritual through their understanding of, though their understanding of God is likely to be framed narrowly by some concept of a creator, for example, of a, of a creator. So we simply do not know the canvas upon which God would paint the portrait of his nature where where Moses was concerned, what needed to be painted over, for example, or perhaps some vestigial influence of Egyptian polytheism. What, what, what was there from his upbringing, or perhaps some, uh, or no doubt the, the monotheism passed down from Abraham was embedded in the people of God in which uh, he now found community. But the trust in this God as a, as a, um, as a marked man now going back into Egypt, a fugitive standing before Pharaoh, a lowly shepherd demanding the immediate evacuation of a million man labor force. I mean, if you consider what he's actually asking uh, Pharaoh to do. So you might need some overwhelming convincing. Uh, so it all starts here with a theophany, the voice of God emanating from, uh, a, flaming, from a flaming bush. Um, so uh, how do you change uh, his his disposition. Uh, and uh, here's Moses uh, approaching this burning bush. How is he going to approach this, this burning bush? Is he going to uh, approach it uh, with reverence, with, with fear? Uh, I mean, what if you knew that you suddenly stepped onto a place where all around you were, were dangerous explosives and at any moment it would mean instant death. I mean, what if, what if you were just stumbling through some, some field, not, not likely around here, but what if you did? And somehow in the underbrush, you know, as you're hacking your way around, you uncovered a sign and it just said, uh, danger, you know, minefield. You know, how likely are you to take another step? Um, you know, you'd freeze in a state of, of, of panic. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's... It's how we understand uh, God and how our presuppositions are. I'm not saying we should fear God in that particular way, uh, but sometimes we just proceed on with our, you know, sort of preconceptions of, of who God is um, without any correction whatsoever to our, our presuppositions. Um, so what we think of God, how we think of God, determines what use God makes of us and how he engages me in the enterprise um, to which I have been called. For example, if my prayer life is intermittent, tepid, or non-existent, how will God engage me? If my time in his word is rushed, brief, mechanical, academic, without meaningful application, or, devo or undevoted, then what? Um, if I am out of sorts with God or whatever, for whatever reason, brooding, will, he, will God be persuaded to see things my way? Uh, or are you a pouting child and God an enabling parent? Hardly. So the degree your understanding of God is flawed, so too your um, usefulness to him and your experience of him will be. So um, to get God right, you need to be in tune with the Spirit and with his word, and the Spirit of God will take the word of God and make the God of the word become a living reality. Um, now, Jesus subsumed the concept of God theologically and more relationally for his disciples when he admonished them to invoke our Father in prayer. And you remember Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, now just to talk about the fatherliness of God, and then again, in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, if we just hone in on this, just for an example, on preconceptions of God, and just to hone in on the idea of the fatherliness of, of God. Um, and then within that context of Luke chapter 5, he's talking about, or Ch Luke chapter 11, he's talking about uh, the behavior of a friend, the expectation of receiving the Holy Spirit. In other words, God awaits the petitions of his children as a father, attentive, caring, with profound personal interest, deep compassion, enabling strength, sufficient resources, and insightful wisdom. So given all that, why would we not rush to him? Why would we not depend upon him? 
why would we try to do for him what he alone is better suited to accomplish through us by his Holy Spirit who stands ready to give in enabling power? So take a step further, Paul focuses and centers the empowering in his son. If you look, for example, at Ephesians, I mentioned this a moment ago, at Ephesians chapter 6 and, and verse 10, a much overlooked verse simply because, well, it's attached to spiritual warfare and who, who looks at that anyway, right? But when you consider this, everything you can read theologically and doctrinally in, in the book of Ephesians all goes to waste if you don't grab Ephesians 6, 10 and following, which is why Paul so strongly says, finally, or with big exclamation points, if you miss this, you've missed everything, right? But he says, be strong or strengthen yourself in the Lord and not in his mighty power, not, that would be a mistranslation, but in, in the strength of his might. Might there refers to what he has intrinsically, which is to say, uses a specific word, which means that which he has in endless supply, and the strength is that which you are able to do. In other words, you draw, in other words, you be strong, strengthen yourself, draw from what he alone has in endless supply. You can't drain it, and then you are able to appropriate that, that strength, the doing part, the doing part. So you get the strength from him. So we are to draw upon his power to become empowered. Now this is, this is Jesus, right? This is Jesus, much as we talk about spirit power, that's because the spirit is the agency that drives all this. If we get the mechanics right in this, our whole Trinitarian model here, but, but just to see what's available to us, we're to draw upon this power to become empowered to perform works which demonstrate or display his might. Now, can you envision Moses performing this way? You know, uh, w would it have been easy for Moses to adopt this model of living as the natural pattern of performing in service to God? In other words, just, just relying then on God's presence and power when you can't see it, but just, just relying, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show up. God said to do this, and I'm just going to have to rely this is going to happen, yet that's what we do each and every day. Yet we have the Holy Spirit and an endless resource of empowering from the Son through the agency of the Spirit to perform works of service intended to glorify God and extend the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. So what is the connection to the fatherliness of God? How was this demonstrated to the disciples? Were they to discern this from their own fathers? No. They were to discern this from the relation of Jesus to his own father. So how weak indeed would be the model of fatherliness if taken from the best of their own human fathers? For example, the father, unlike human fathers, is unchanging in his nature and constant toward his children. So Moses needed to learn this. He would not know God as father, but he would come to God as the unchanging one, the eternal constant one, the I am, the I will be. This is the testimony of the Lord through the prophet Malachi. I am the Lord, I change not. This is the testimony of the writer of the letter of Hebrews concerning Jesus, and we just saw this. We experience, we experience change. We expect change then. We see supplies diminish and, and quantities reduce. We cannot fathom omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, omnibenevolence. And the attributes of God whose operations abound in constancy and without diminishing in effect, range of application or supply. And some folks struggle in the area of day-to-day -day provision and concerns related to making ends meet, yet even these basic necessities are delivered daily from the hand of our Heavenly Father. Remember Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 6, your Heavenly Father knows you have need of them. He keeps referencing all these things in terms of your heavenly father, right in the context of the model prayer, our father. And as a footnote, we seldom ask, ask our heavenly father, since our markets contain ready supplies, though recent interruptions, you know, wow, supply chain stuff, right? Give us pause. But when he says, you know, pray this way to your father, give us this day our daily bread by doubt that we do, right? We don't, we don't, um, because 
pretty much it's, it's already there unless you're in certain parts, parts of the world. But do we pray as though without his supply, we would have nothing, no income, no roof, no clothes, no, no food? Well, there was su sufficient yesterday, but what about today? And then there are the needs of tomorrow. So you recall the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 26, Matthew 26, um, 32, where, where he calls attention to your heavenly Father knows. So this truth, the truth of constancy, of the fatherliness of God, infuses new meaning into Matthew 6, 33, 34. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteous, all these things will be added unto you, sufficient to the day is the, is the, evil, is the evil thereof, or, or, or is the trouble uh, thereof. The same constant, the same God as the God of today is, is the God of tomorrow. We ask as though not presuming upon our own ability to, to draw from what we, we have supplied, but acknowledging that without our Heavenly Father, we would have nothing, and that whatever we do comes from Him and all belongs to Him. This was David when he was supplying out of his own wealth for the temple, said, none of it's mine anyway, and it's, and it's all God's. And if the same God has all of my todays already managed, why am I worried about them and let alone all my tomorrows? And some folks struggle in the area of realized forgiveness, that is receiving forgiveness from God. In other words, has God truly and fully forgiven them? And yet we're reminded in 1 John 4 and 14, this father-son relationship, the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. And the apostle Paul declared, that at a very specific time in human history, God sent his son into the world to redeem us that we might receive the adoption of sons, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. So again, it, it is the fatherliness of God, the father and son relationship, and our relation to God through the son being born of the spirit of God, John 3, 8, that secures the abiding nature of our relationship with God. That's Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 37 through 30. Who shall separate us from the, the love of God, right? So it's important to understand as well that unlike human fathers, God the Father is unlimited in his capacity to care for his children. Even the best fathers can't care infinitely, right? So the psalmist relates this uh, truth in Psalm 55 and 22, and then it's, it's noted by Peter in 1 Peter 5, um, casting all your care upon him. You know, but first, the command there is to humble. Humble yourself, and, and part of that is that participle. How? Casting. Casting. That isn't a command to cast. It's a participle. Casting. How do you, how do you humble? Casting all your care upon him. He cares he cares for you. And it's that same idea of, of caring. And notice that's present tense. You know, this is the character of God. He is the one who cares. And so Jesus really made it clear in that parable of the good shepherd in John chapter 10, using that same verb for caring, that that's the fundamental difference between the good shepherd and the, the hired man, you know, because this... This, this hired man, he's the guy that doesn't care at all. And he uses that verb right there. So you're supposed to, here's God in First Peter who, who cares for you, but here's the hired man, he didn't care. He doesn't care for this. He doesn't care for the, the hired, hired man. He doesn't care for the sheep. But what does a good shepherd do? He lays down his life for the sheep. And so this is a picture of, of how God sent his son. You know, Romans chapter 5 and, and verse 8, God demonstrated his love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. So since his nature does not change, cannot change, his care is constant. Now, no, no, notice this. Because it's God, right? The tendency will be to think of care in terms of another human being and to draw that equivalence. God cares like another human being. And so you have... You have in theological language called equivocal, analogical, univocal use of terms, right? Without getting into all that stuff. You can't do that with God, right? So listen, um, because God's nature does not change, cannot change, his care is this. It's constant and it's maximal. 
What does that mean? It's always the best. God cares the most, always. He delivers the most care, the best care all the time in every situation. No human father can do that. That's why you can't measure when you see the word father, go back to the semantic class, the referent. Can't do that. So God said, don't, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. I'm the changeless one. Don't tie me to a thing. Don't do that to me. I'm just so far beyond that. Don't attach your expectations to some other person and measure me by that. So no human father, regardless of intention, can do that. And then also unlike human fathers, the father is the possession of all believers. Because when you think of it, we all have different human fathers. But, but we're all God's possession. We all share that in common. It's Deuteronomy 32, 9, by redemption, right? God brought them all out of the house of, of slave, slavery. And then the apostle John uses that language where all the, the children of God, so all believers have a common father in God and all believers share a common experience of the same father through the son by the working of the Holy Spirit. And you have this in, in that same context in Romans chapter eight and Galatians four, this, this notion of, of referring to God in, in that Aramaic Abba, Abba father. You know, the idea is that we enjoy this personal contact uh, to the end of experiencing the fullness of joy. You see that in uh, the opening uh, uh, prologue to, to John's letter, John's first John, and uh, that which our, our eyes have seen, our hands have handled, and, and so on. You, you see the sense of a, a deep personal relationship with Jesus, and that's, that's that same our personal relationship that we have with God. And in Matthew chapter six, in that same context, he says, listen, when you pray, when you pray, he commends them to when, when you pray, you know, go into your closet, go into that innermost chamber and, and shut the door. Uh, and this is what's, what's anticipated in terms of their communion with the heavenly father. So whatever our presuppositions of God, whatever our thinking about God, all must be reduced to the fatherliness of God and to the specific relation of Jesus to, to his father. And so does my prayer life align with that of Jesus's classroom instruction to call upon our father in such a life transforming way? How does knowing my heavenly father, um, uh, that, that he, he hears me, is caring for me, will answer me, stands at the ready to supply my every need, sends his abiding Holy Spirit to empower me for witness and for service, how does knowing this fortify the steps of faith taken into unknown days, um, full of obstacles and uphill climbs? How does that, how does that help me? And Paul uses this term, walk, how many times? Walk. We walk by faith, not by, but he uses, I, I, I gave up, you know, counting how many times Paul uses that and you start to get it. It's a, it's a Hebrew idiom. Sometimes it's just a metaphor. Sometimes it's a Hebrew idiom. But it just is this idea of you, you, you conduct your life by this central, central operating principle. And here the, the fatherliness of God. My heavenly father cares for me, is now in the act of caring for me. As I offer myself to him in yielded service to him, in full reliance upon him, in this moment, for this step, now, today, the caring of God is Active. God does not sympathize and empathize, but works and acts to supply our lives with his promises on a delivery schedule that serves the dictates of his perfect plan. His caring is not conditioned upon my faithfulness, though I risk his discipline if I live contrary to his revealed will, but his caring is enjoyed in the exercise of my obedience and full reliance upon his nature. For in this, I acknowledge my true worth and realize that I am loved and love him in return. Lord, thank you for an opportunity to uh, pursue uh, knowing you or how to know you, through, again, through the lens of Moses, through the lens of Peter, through the lens of Paul, through the lens of uh, John um, in, in a meaningful way. Uh, and thank you for your word that without it, we we wouldn't have this opportunity. And thank you for your spirit to guide us. Um, grant us the, the, the fortitude as we uh, advance through this day and, and the week to come by your grace and, and uh, enabling uh, strength and health 
Um, we ask uh, for your watch care over uh, each one of us. Um, guide our steps uh, and our, our, our spirits and uh, make us uh, capable uh, witnesses to you with those with whom we come in contact. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.